Uh, so my name's Ryan. I'm an associate software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, I work on a tool or on a team called Contra. Uh, we're working to unify and streamline all of the uh, product delivery across the company. Uh, more specifically, I work on a tool called Lynchpin, which is a provisioner that I'm going to be talking to you about today. So how many of you have, well, first of all, can I see a show of hands? Who has any experience with Ansible? Awesome. It's a good place to start. Uh, so some of you may have worked on a project or may currently be working on a project that has some sort of Ansible script or Ansible playbook that looks like this that's made to deploy whatever you work on. It's like 900 lines of code. It's really difficult to tell what's going on if you need to modify or update things. Um, and hopefully if, you, you know, if, you, if you're deploying slightly different versions of it, you, you use extra vars to parameterize it. But if you're doing that a lot and you have a lot of different parameters you could change, you end up with these really long commands uh, that are kind of difficult to uh, difficult to remember whenever you want to modify something. Uh, so we developed Lynchpin as a solution to that. Lynchpin is more or less a declarative wrapper around Ansible. So instead of telling Ansible how you want things to be done, you tell Lynchpin what you want, and Lynchpin figures out how to do it. Uh, it's highly extensible through the use of something called hooks, and it has a pretty simple API and CLI, which you can see below here. Uh, so this is just a quick overview of the architecture of Lynchpin before we get into the weeds. Um, I know there's a lot going on. Everything in yellow here is user inputs. Uh, so there's topology, layout, and hooks, which we'll get into what each of those do. Um, those are inputted to Lynchpin, which then converts that into something that Ansible can understand. Uh, Ansible goes, provisions, whatever cloud providers it needs to provision. And then Lynchpin takes the data it gets back from those clouds, and it sends them to, to a few different outputs. Uh, we won't talk too much about those, but uh, all you need to know for now is that the RunDB is what allows Lynchpin to store data from every single time you've run Lynchpin. It's what allows you to, say, run Lynchpin up twice in a row and tear down the stuff you provisioned the first, in the first run. And, and the inventory is um, a user... Uh, is a, is a type of output that the user can customize based on the layout. Uh, so Lynchpin Workspaces at its core is, is made up of something called a pin file, which describes all the inputs and outputs you need for provisioning. Uh, a pin file is a bunch of targets, which is a target is just something you're going to provision um, as a single unit. You're never going to break down a target into things you might want to provision one at a time. Um, and each target can contain a topology, a layout, and hooks. So the topology is technically all you need to provision something. It describes your desired state. Now, so here we've got a topology that provisions some OpenStack resources. Um, resource groups in Lynchpin describe a set of resources you want to provision to a single provider. So here we're just provisioning OpenStack resources, but if we wanted to provision something to AWS as well, we could do that just in a different resource group. Um, and within a resource group, you have resource definitions, which are, you know, everything you want to provision. We have a key pair here um, and four OpenStack server instances. If we wanted to provision a, another OpenStack server with slightly different parameters, we would do that as another resource definition. You could do an OpenStack network, for example, as another resource definition. And then we get to the layout. So the layout... Are there dependencies between them? Uh, what, what do you, so well, you can't spin up a server without having a network. Yes. Yes. So the resource definitions are provisioned by default in order, and so in this example, I actually provisioned a key pair, and then I used that key pair as the as the key pair for those servers. Um, you can provision asynchronously, in which case you of course lose those guarantees, but by default it's done asynchronously. Uh, so moving on to the layout, the layout is how you define user outputs. Uh, the layouts are used to generate an inventory file, which is something like what you'll see on the right. Uh, after provisioning, Lynchman gets a list of all of the hosts that are provisioned. So this doesn't include networks or load balances or, or anything like that. It's OpenStack compute instances, EC2 instances, instances etc. Uh, and it goes through this list of hosts and it assigns it to the relevant host groups. Uh, so for example, here we'll get a list of four hosts, which we saw in the topology earlier. Uh, it'll pop the first one off and say that's the master, so I need to assign it to the workers and the master's host group, pop the next two off and assign it to the workers host group, and finally pop the last one off and assign it to the database. Uh, in addition to listing each host in this group, um, variables which are defined in the var section can be associated with each. So here we just have
out the host name equals Dunder IP variable. Dunder IP is a built-in. It's just the default host name for whatever host you're using. But any data that that Lynchpin gets back from a cloud provider, you can put in your VARs. So that can be networks, that can be zones in OpenStack. Um, instead of a public IPv4 address, for example, you could do a private IPv4 address. Um, and and this, this data, you know, by default is in a human-readable format like this, but you can also format it as JSON if you want it to be parsed by, parsed by a script or something like that. And finally, we get to hooks. So hooks are what allows Lynchman to be extensible. It allows you to define custom actions that go beyond just the basic provisioning. Uh, you can write them in a whole bunch of languages, and one thing that makes them so powerful is that they can communicate with one another, as well as communicate with Lynchman itself and with, with the data that Lynchman gets back from these cloud providers. Uh, so just as, as an example here, there are four hooks. Uh, so our first hook here, which would run before you provision something, it's a pre-up hook. Um, creates a floating IP pool within OpenStack. And then after the provisioning is done, these two post-up hooks will be run. Uh, the first one installs dependencies on the hosts, and the second one sets up a firewall. And then finally, if you run Lynchman destroy, after destroying, uh, this post-destroy hook will be, uh, will be run to destroy the floating IP pool. Now, let's say your, your first script, your create FIP pool, you only want to create the pool if it doesn't already exist. Um, and then you only want to destroy the FIP pool at the, at the end if you want, if you had to create it in the first place. Uh, this is the, where hook communication comes into play. That first hook can save data to the RunDB and Lynchpin that says, yes, I actually had to create this FIP pool, or no, I didn't. And the post-destroy hook can take action based on that. Uh, the last thing I want to point out is this context variable. Uh, the context determines whether a hook is run on the machine on which Lynchpin is running or on the provision resources. So in this pre-up hook context is false, it'll run locally, or in the post-up hook when, where you're installing the dependencies, context is true and it'll run uh, remotely. So now that we've kind of seen how all these components work, let's let's put them together. I got a couple demos for you. Uh, there's one that's a little bit easier, a little bit less flashy, and the second one I actually can't do because we're not on the VPN, unfortunately. So I'll go through and explain to you how it would have worked, so you can see kind of a, a complex deployment via Lynchpin. So let's say I just want to deploy a basic Livered instance on Lynchpin. Um, I can do that. I can run Lynchpin init. Uh, and say libvert. So, so this is going to pull down actually a directory we have on the Lynchpin repository um, with a number of resources used to provision Lynchpin. Um, so we have all sorts of examples here, but I don't actually need any of that, so I'm going to delete that. And I'm going to create a, a, a target called devconf demo. I only need a topology, really. Um, so, and resource groups, I'm just going to have one because I'm only provisioning uh, Livered instances. So, I'm going to name it Livered Demo. Uh, and the type, like I said, will be Livered. Um, and then I got my resource definitions. So, let's name it uh, Demo Node. Uh, role will be Livered Node. Uh, and then there are, there are some fields in here that are requ that are required and some that aren't. I'm sure you saw all the all the fields in that really big pin file. Um, so not all of those are required, but let's see what is required. Uh, I believe the URI is required, so that's... Um, you only get one more line of this. I know. It's kind of hard to do 10 lines or less when you, uh, when you have seven lines of, of bootstrapping code. So we'll pretend that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, I was a little ambitious with my title. Should have gone with seven lines. But uh, uh, roll, I of course need an image. I didn't bother memorizing this image name, I'll be honest. I'm just going to copy it. Um, or an image source. Uh, I know I need memory. So I'll set that to 2048 megabytes. Um, and I want to make sure this is valid before I run it. I want to make sure I got all my syntax correct. So I'll run Lynchman validate um, and try to validate that target. And let's see what happens. Oh, and field topology name is required. Oh, that's a, that's a pretty basic one. Oh, and I know what else I forgot. So you could have run that first and just keep running that until you get no errors. You know exactly what you need. 
Yeah. But I wasn't going to start off yeah, with an empty topology. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, we've been opening all this stuff. I wouldn't have known that. But even the, the tool will tell you, okay, you missed the topology. Exactly. Yeah, and it'll tell you if you misspelled something. For example, the only one where it's a little bit finicky is the roll. If you leave out roll, sometimes you'll get an error. Um, but, yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty reliable. Um, the other thing I forgot is the is the vCPUs, I think, and I need one of those. But things like count, like you could provision two of these and it'll default to one, so uh, not all the fields are required by, ne by default. I think it uses the default network. So I got a success here. Um, the topology is valid, so I can run linchpin, dash bv. It uses the same verbosity flags as Ansible, so um, that'll look familiar to you guys. Up, um, and if I had multiple targets, in this pen file, and I just want to run one, I can provide that at the end of the command line. Um, and we'll gather facts. Any facts we need, we'll... Oh, yeah, I forgot I'm not part of the liver group, so... It'll run any... Uh... I might talk tomorrow, but I kind of deal with that. <laughs> So, so run any bootstrapping stuff we need. It'll download the image for us. It'll provision our node, um, start our VM. If we define networks, it'll make sure they're there. Um, I don't know why it's waiting for it to shut down, but, but you get the idea. Um, takes a minute or so you know if you're familiar with ansible this is all this is all pretty standard the, the the big advantage of this is the abstraction that with that just short chunk of code you can get this provision and i can do pseudo pseudo -verse list all and it'll and you'll see the demo node zero is running there so you're talking to the lib versions things on your laptop right here you're talking lib version uh right now yes yeah i think if you change the uri it'll you, you can use a remote libvirt instance um so, and then of course, I won't make you sit through watching this, but yeah, tear down is pretty easy as well. Uh, so, let's move on to something cooler. This is supposed to be my flashy demo. I was going to provision uh, a compute node on OpenStack. I was going to deploy OpenShift to that node and then deploy an application to OpenShift and show that it's running. But like I said, I can't access the Red Hat VPN right now, and so I can't deploy it. Um, but I can work. I can step you th through, uh, you know, all of the components to see how it would work. What? Is it is it the the wireless here? Yeah. If you change the TCP from UDP, that might help. Okay, I'll I'll keep that in mind for the future. But I didn't. I, I someone else had suggested I set up tethering on my phone, and I couldn't get it working. So um, I would have liked to record the demo, but I just got it working last night. If we're being honest, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's working. You'll have to trust me on that. Um, part of this is actually in our examples. So if you go to our GitHub repository, there's an OpenShift on OpenStack example and an OpenShift on Beaker example uh, that you can take a look at. Uh, so this pin file is actually, uh, it looks a lot simpler uh, because we separated out the topology and the layout. Um, Lynchpin will look for the topology and layout in the same directory as the pin file in these topologies and layouts directories. So. I go to topology, OpenShift on OpenStack. We actually split things into two resource groups here um, because, well, mylinchpin.com has asynchronous provisioning set to true, and I wanted to make sure that the, uh, that the what's it called, the OS server instance is provisioned last. So the first resource group provisions a network and a security group. I'm not going to go too much into the details of that, but that's just, you know, this is all the rules that uh, OpenShift needs in order to be able to run correctly. And the second one um, creates a creates a pretty large uh, compute instance for OpenShift to run on top of. And of course, I pass it the cloud config so I can SSH in and Lynchpin can run those hooks. Um, and this credentials section at the bottom, which you didn't see in libvirt, um, allows you to pass a credentials file. In the case of OpenStack, it can also read environment variables. That's typically what I do there. But uh, something like AWS doesn't allow you to do that. So you, you can pass a credentials file there. Um, and moving on to the layouts, because we've seen something like that before. Um, 
the only thing that's really different here is this far section in the host groups. Uh, so this will set environment variables on the host themselves. Um, and OpenShift needs some of these environment variables. So you know, OpenShift public host name and things like that allow OpenShift to set up routing, um, Ansible SSH users so that Ansible knows how to log in, things like that. Um, OpenShift release so that OpenShift knows what, what release to set up. Um, if you notice, there's a Jinja template here on line 26. Um, or you probably can't read that when I do that. But there's a Jinja template here. Uh, so Lynchpin does support templating. Um, in fact, if you... Um, when you're when you're pulling variables in for the layouts for that var section from from the data that AWS and OpenStack send back, you can access that via Jinja templates. Um, you and you can also command early on. You like the command. How does that know like which version of your code that you would use? Is it local directory or is it? Is there like uh, multiple? Can can I get to that later? Because I want to I want to stay on track here. Um, so. Now I lost my Oh yeah, you can also send template data to Lynchpin. Um, so if I were to go to my topology here, kind of jumping around, I'm sorry. Um, I could, instead of doing m1.large, I could do flavor here. And when I ran Lynchpin up, I could send in template data. Um, flavor um, m1.large, and that would have the same effect. This won't run because it'll... Um, oh yeah, sorry, it should be linchpin template data up. This won't run correct correctly because it's uh, um, because of the VPN, but you get the idea. Um, but lastly, I wanted to focus on the hooks here. Um, so we have four hooks here, once again, kind of mixing things like the context and all that. So the first hook installs an RPM repository that's just the OpenShift origin RPM through CentOS. Uh, the second playbook, we actually cloned the, the OpenShift Ansible repository from GitHub and used those Ansible playbooks for our hooks. So if you have existing infrastructure that you used to use after you provision to do bootstrapping, you can just plug that right into Lynchpin. Um, instead of using a hook to pull it down every sign, Every single time we run it, we had a make file that we, we used to pull, and I did that before the demo. But uh, yes, that's within the OpenShift Ansible repository. We just set up some prerequisites and deploy the cluster, um, let the experts in deploying OpenShift do that for us. And the last thing we do on the local machine, if you notice context is false, is log in to, to OpenShift so that you can, you can run OC commands in that. Um, that's a Python script that I just wrote, um, wrote myself. And then finally, we had a topology for Rocket chat um, for deploying that on on OpenShift. You go to the rocket chat deposit, uh, topology. The resource definitions, as you can see, are exactly what you'd see in like an S2I image. Uh, it's just you know this basic YAML. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of code. There's like 600 lines here, um, but you know, it's it's all pretty standard. And that will that is the equivalent of running OC apply and OC new app on these resources. So yeah, I'm sorry you couldn't see that running, um, but yeah, I, I hope you you get the idea. You can kind of see the power that Lynchpin provides. Uh, so moving back, the, there's one more thing which I want to talk about, and that's the API. So Lynchpin can be used programmatically. Uh, the, the, the API you see here is our older API that we're currently phasing out. As you can see, it's, there's a lot of kind of bootstrapping, doing it yourself. Um, but you, you, know, you set up your workspace, um, you validate, you can run Lynchpin up with the provisioner.do action. You could also run Lynchpin destroy with that. Um, and then if you'd like, you can get the run data from the run DB after provision um, and generate a layout from that. Um, the, the planned API, which we currently have a beta version out of now, is quite a bit simpler. Uh, so by default, you can use the workspace in the same way where you provide a file path. But here, you just have to run workspace.up, and it'll provision all of that for you. Uh, you can also generate pin files as a dict if you'd like. We actually work with a tool called Carbon, which is uh, something. It's an, it's an integration testing tool that uh, one of the QE teams is working on. Um, and they generate um, generate pin files programmatically for customer scenarios, um, so they can do that as a dict instead of having to create a file on the disk every single time they want to they want to generate a new uh, a new pin file. So now, do you have any questions? So back and actually, can you? Just you my question uh, hold, so, oh, sorry, we want to get you on the mic so that we can. 
Hello. So having had to do this for years and years, and I see how you ended up there, and I really like the elegance of, of what you did. I'm just trying to figure out how I would use this on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you ran the linchpin command, it seemed to know the context. Is that just based on like files inside the present working directory, kind of like doing a, uh, a git command and looks for a dit, uh, dot git subdirectory or something like that? Or how does it know like which cluster you're working with, right? You want to be able to work with multiple resources or resource things. How do you know which so, one? So I'm actually going to go into a slightly different command for a second called linchpin fetch. So linchpin fetch allows you to to basically do a git pull of a repository, actually a pull of a, of a subdirectory within a repository that contains a linchpin workspace to make it easy to share uh, provisioning uh, tools between, you know, between different people. Uh, linchpin init basically wraps linchpin fetch. Uh, if you run linchpin init by default, it creates a folder um, and pulls the, the dummy workspace examples we have within linchpin. So we have an examples directory in our repository, and it'll pull that. Dummy is just a provider we made up that, that mocks provisioning so we can test some of the other features we have within linchpin. Um, but you, if you provide another provider name or another example name that we have, it'll pull that workspace instead of the, um, instead of the dummy workspace. Does it do Git locally when I do this? The linchpin in it is it creating a local Git repo for that? It's not creating a Git repo, no. Okay, so if I want to do Git ops and all that, I just do that externally to this, and yeah. it's, it's just a two-step process. Yes, okay. because you might want to have a linchpin workspace within an existing repository. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you you showed uh, libvirt, OpenStack, and you mentioned AWS. Mm -hmm. What what does Linchpin support as far as like virtualization technologies? Uh, virtualization, uh, I believe we support libvirt, overt, and VMware right now. And VMware meaning vSphere or ESX Direct? I will have to get back okay. to that. Okay, thanks. Um, so with the hooks, uh, maybe I missed it, but where um, you have the hooks and you have like uh, the playbook specified, um, where uh, how does it know where to look for those like YAML files? Are those local in the workspace, or are those yes. pulled down from like the, you said the OpenShift Ansible? Yes, stuff? so they're local in the workspace. I didn't, I did have the the tree here, but I didn't mention it. So within the workspace, there's a hooks directory, um, and so Linchpin will search for the hooks in the hooks directory at a path of the of hooks slash the type, in this case we have Ansible, and then the name of the hook. So hook slash Ansible slash create FIP pool is here. Um, in the other example I had, the OC login would be searched for in hook slash Python slash OC login. And, gotcha. yeah. Thanks. So kind of a big picture question, but like what exactly is provisioning and why would you use Linchpin with software like OpenShift or Ansible? Uh, so provisioning is, how do I define provisioning? Um, it, it's it, provisioning is, I guess, creating resources to use for for any sort of like computation or networking. Um, in in the case of like virtualization, you're kind of reserving resources, um, but you're also defining resources so that so that they can be managed. Something like OpenStack can uh, you know keep track of say say or actually I'll use OpenShift. I'm more familiar with it. OpenShift can, for example, create track of pods. So if you provision pods to OpenShift, um, OpenShift can make sure they're running, and if they go down, it can reprovision them. Um, so, so the advantage, uh, so uh, traditionally, way back when, uh, provisioning was largely done by hand. You wanted a VM, you had to go and you know run a command line or run your own script to create this VM. Um, and then tools like Terraform and Ansible started to, to be built that automate that, um, but they're largely procedural. So you tell it the exact steps that you want to take, and it's hard to parameterize them, and it's hard to modify them. Um, and, and it's hard to create them programmatically. It's hard to tell, get a computer to figure out how to get from point A to point B. Um, so the advantage of something like Linchpin that's very very focused on one thing, Ansible can also do a lot more than just provisioning. Uh, is, so Linchpin's very focused on one thing, so it makes it very streamlined to provision things. Um, it makes it easy to figure out how to do it programmatically because um, you know, a piece of software only has to figure out what it wants. Um, and it's easier to read and modify. Hi, 
Hi. Uh, so this looks awesome uh, first. So thank you. Um, would I be wrong to say that it, f it feels and sounds very similar to what Terraforms is doing? And is this like intentionally being created as an alternative to that so that we have like an Ansible native um, version? So you're right. It, it does seem very similar to what Terraform is doing. I know Terraform, actually, you're right. I think Terraform is also declarative. Um, I don't know what the trade-off is between Terraform and Ansible or between Terraform and Lynchman. I'm not, just not that familiar with it. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry. I, don't, I can't really answer that. But uh, I can get back to you if you want afterwards. If you give me your contact info, I'd be happy. Yeah, I, I've got a ton more questions, so I'll follow up with you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Someone else have a question? Hey, thanks, Ryan. That was a great talk. Um, so one of the things I, that I'm really interested in here is the ability, and I'm going to butcher the jargon and linchpin, but the, the ability to pass variables from like one stage to the next or one task to the next, you're kind of talking about that. And, and I'm guessing that this can wrap the Ansible K8s module pretty easily to deploy things into Kubernetes or whatever. Has anybody given thought to doing like a linchpin operator or something like that in the same vein as like the Ansible operator? Yeah, so we've talked about it. Um, I, I, I mean, I think the reason we haven't done it yet is just because you know there's more demand from customers for other things. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that's come up. Um, it's you know, if you have a linchpin operator, you, I believe operators are pods, so they're running all the time, um, and so that would sort of require like a linchpin process that stays running. Which right now, linchpin is kind of a one-off deployment, so we'd have to look into um, if you if we'd be building a pod that you know triggers linchpin when it's run, or if there's like a linchpin data that uh, daemon, excuse me, that actively stores data um, and manages these resources. Okay. <laughs> All right, any other questions? So you said that Lynchpin is aligned with like Ansible as a wrapper. Um, how is the versioning? So when like you put out new versions of Lynchpin, how does it align with the versions of Ansible? It's not. Um, yeah, so right now, um, we, we don't really work with the Ansible team much, so, so we don't align the versions. Lynchpin is compatible with multiple different versions of Ansible. We try to be backwards compatible with whatever current version of Ansible is, as well as you know anything older. I think we're technically backwards compatible back to like 2.4 right now, but. They run Fedora, they don't even run on RHEL yet. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll make a product test or something. All right, is that everything? Any other questions?